why don't you tell me what you're up to lately and what you're excited about? Yeah, um, I guess lots of different things. I mean, I'm working on the second edition of the D3 book, which is going to be really great. Uh, a lot of things have changed in the last two years. The good news is nothing has changed that broke anything in the first edition, so that's all accurate and correct. But uh, there's some new features and new techniques and new tools and stuff, so um, that'll be coming out next year sometime. That'll be great. Uh, I'm also really excited about P5.js. This is the new sort of rethinking of processing, uh, which was originally written for Java, but for the JavaScript context. So basically what all that means is we're going to have this really nice, kind of super beginner friendly, really easy way to draw interactive things to the canvas in the browser. Uh, and it also supports like audio and all kinds of things. So um, that's going to be really great, not just for me to have fun with, but like to teach in the classroom context, because uh, I also I teach a lot. and teach uh, design students who are new to code and sort of maybe don't necessarily have a great comfort level with coding or things that look too mathy. Uh, so processing and P5 are great for that. And then I have uh, a couple other projects. One project I'm really excited about is um, kind of a sequel to Kindred Britain, which is this digital humanities interactive visualization project I did with uh, Nick Jenkins at Stanford and Elijah Meeks. Uh, formerly at Stanford. So Nick and I are working on a sequel to that, which is called Kindred London, and it's sort of the same idea. It's like a social network for um, British history, um, but we're doing lots and lots of mapping, and it's obviously London-specific. So we have, we have permissions to use all these historical maps. It's going to be visually very rich, um, very beautiful, lots of like crazy interaction. And even for people who maybe you know, aren't historians, aren't super excited about British culture, like you'll be able to find famous people on the map and see where were they born, where did they die, like where were they married, like what kinds of neighborhoods do they live in? And we can put all of this in context, and this is all using D3, so you say you search for, um, you know, Charles Darwin or whoever, it'll show you kind of all the information we have about Darwin's life on a map that's contemporary for him. So you can see what, not only kind of his life, but in that context of what the city looked like during his time of being alive. And it, it changes a lot. Like a couple hundred years ago, there weren't any bridges, right? So you had to take boats back across the river, or you would just always stay on your side of the river. So um, you can sort of fly through time and see as those bridges are built, and you have more and more streets, and the city grows. And I think it's all very interesting. Yeah. That's really cool. When will that be ready? Uh, hopefully also next year sometime. We're just, um, we've sort of I don't know, in the middle of the design process, like we have wireframes and concepts and we're um, talking with developers and things, so we're working on getting it actually implemented, but we kind of have the vision to know what we're going to do, yeah. And so back to the processing stuff, what about it makes it so great for beginners? Well, for processing uh, and P5, but processing generally and kind of this whole family of tools now that have come out of processing, it's it's a programming language that is it's designed for beginners so it's it sort of has a dual purpose actually it's designed for artists and designers so the actual language like the function names and things use language that designers are already familiar with so if I'm drawing a rectangle the command is rect and if I want to set the stroke it's just stroke and stroke width and fill and opacity and you're using these terms that people are familiar with from using mostly like the Adobe Creative Suite applications. Um, so the terminology is just built in and that's already familiar which is is nice. Then processing also kind of has this pedagogical uh, purpose and mission which is to expose more people to the role of computation in uh, compu the role of computation within the visual arts and within design. Um, so that means thinking about generative art and process and logic and sequence, as well as like bringing in data, obviously, and doing the things that are very difficult to do by hand, but the computer can do practically without thinking about it. So it's it's um, I guess I you know I contribute to the processing website, and right now we're working on. 3.0, so I think as of today, Processing 3.0 Alpha 11 is out, so you can download that and play with it. Um, but it's just really powerful, really fun software. Like, it's the kind of thing you can sit down, and within a few minutes, sitting down with students or, you know, adult students or whoever, in a couple of minutes, you can have 
shapes and things up and moving around on the screen with the mouse and people just find it really powerful. It's like, oh, I never thought I could do that before and processing makes it pretty easy. So do you find that your design students are pretty receptive to the idea of introducing coding into kind of their skill set? Yeah, it's um, yes and no. So some are super excited because they've seen work out there by now. Like it's kind of getting more popular. They've seen work that they know, okay, this was made with code and I'm motivated to learn how that works. Um, a good chunk of my students anyway, and I'm guessing most students in general are maybe choose the field because they have certain preconceptions about what design is and it's um, they tend to think of it more about image making and um, certainly don't think of it as involving kind of math and logic and systems and process in that way. So they're not thinking about it as computer science majors come in and they're like, I'm going to learn how to program, obviously. Um, so our students come in and I sort of have to trick them initially into realizing that it can be fun and powerful and that's super rewarding because first of all, it, it it's challenging helping students get, un get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Did I say that right? Mm -hmm. Get comfortable, yeah. So, you know, they realize they have to push themselves a little bit. And at first, you know, the payoff is not obvious. It's like, why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? But certainly by the end of the first project and the end of the semester, they usually come around. And even if they were still really frustrated and it was a like, difficult experience, usually they can see the power and the value of it. So they can go on to like work with other people, work with developers. Um, but most of them love it in the end. And they're sort of like, this is amazing. I'm so glad that we did this, even though I was really mad at you in the first week of class. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Good for the evaluations. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just, just made it in the end. And so did you have, face any challenges kind of getting comfortable with P5, or was it close enough to the general processing stuff that you were kind of slid in? Um, P5, well, I'm still learning P5 myself for sure. I mean, there are a lot of things that are the same and a lot of things that are different. Um, the syntax is a little bit different just because it's JavaScript instead of Java underneath. Um, one thing I'm excited about with P5 is that there's a, a standalone IDE in process. So uh, an amazing thing about processing is it's not just the language, um, which you can use separately in another development environment, but it's also this like standalone application. So for students especially, like you just download the application and you open it and you have a window. It's like a normal GUI program. Um, P5 doesn't totally have that yet. The editor is in development. It's in like super, super alpha or something right now. Um, so right now it works best kind of as a JavaScript library and you're using your normal development environment and all that stuff. So there's a little bit more setup, but the vision is to have the same sort of standalone, one click, I'm in and I'm working sort of environment as processing proper. And I think that'll just in terms of learning, that'll eliminate a lot of these sort of steps that involve setup and everything. Mm -hmm. So it'll be much easier to use in the classroom then. So right now, do people kind of have to know JavaScript then to get up and running with it? Um, to no, get a up or? no okay. not at all. I mean, there's tons and tons of tutorials online. Uh, I mean, when you're writing P5, you are writing JavaScript, essentially. And that's, um, you don't have to know that you're writing JavaScript, right? You just know you're working with P5. but. Uh, there's definitely, I mean, there's that little bit of learning curve just as if you were doing plain JavaScript or not. It's just that P5 gives you a much easier way to get visual kind of interesting results more quickly. Mm -hmm. So the idea is even though you still have this learning curve, you're getting that kind of visual reward just a little bit up the curve rather than waiting until you've been banging your head against the wall for months and then finally you get something working, right? It's like within minutes or hours, you have something really interesting. Mm -hmm. So you have the Kindred London thing going, and you have the book, so that'll keep you busy for a while. Mm -hmm. But what's a tool that you, not necessarily that you're going to make, but that you hope that someone will make in the future? Something that would be useful or fun, whether for teaching or just mm -hmm. for fooling around with images? Yeah. Well, so one, one project I'm really excited about, uh, Ian Johnson has been a big leader in the D3 community, and he has a new Kickstarter campaign that is already funded but is still accepting money, I guess, uh, called Building Blocks. And within the D3 community, there's this huge culture around building examples. Like Mike Bostock, uh, the primary author of D3, has really encouraged people to build examples. And he built this service called Blocks 
that lets you basically post a chunk of code just as an example, like here's how to do this in D3. Um, the problem with blocks is that, again, for beginners, there's like this kind of five or 10 step process to get something posted on that service. And um, if you're already super skilled with Git and all these tools, it's like not a big deal. But for all these new people sort of coming into the community and starting with D3 for the first time, it's kind of a headache. So uh, anyway, Ian is building this tool that will make it super, super easy, kind of like one click to post a block. And then the value of having this block is then you can share that with people. Like you just have a URL, so you can post that to Stack Overflow for help or to the D3 Google group or um, in the classroom context, maybe that's how you turn in your assignment to your instructors. You just post the URL and say, here's my project. Um, and I think it'll also make you know, suggesting refinements easier because each block is its each block is really a gist, so it's its own Git repository, and there's all these like layers of things people don't want to have to think about. But um, you know, if somebody posts a question, they're like, "Hey, you know, these things aren't lining up. How do I get them to line up?" You can look at it, make a tweak, and then make that a new block. And you're like, "Hey, I've revised your block." So um, I think that's that's like a really exciting project, and kind of related to that, one thing I've uh, did recently is taught a new online course through the Knight Center for Journalism in the Americas. So it's, we're not calling it a MOOC because it's not massive enough to be massive and it's not open um, because we're charging money for it because we're spending a lot of time on it. Uh, but we're calling it a BOC, so it's a big online course. And uh, we're cutting it off at 500 people. And we offered it a few months ago. It was really successful. And one part of that course was we had all the students share their projects using blocks. So that's that's like another context outside of the physical classroom where it'll be like this thing Ian is making will make it super helpful and easier to do kind of online, you know, exchanges, online teaching, stuff like that. Great. Thank you very much, Scott. Yeah, thanks. Great talking.